today, a young man faces cancer. This isn't going to be good. For a second time. Everywhere and growing. The diagnosis. He will die immediately. And the unlikely cure. I'm going to go for it, even if it kills me. Plus, the lead singer from the band Outspoken, both on stage and off. That right there was just the be all and the end all. It was everything. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Palestinian terrorists are at it again. Israel confirms a Palestinian teenager carried out a bus bombing, and now Israel has uncovered a terror tunnel from Gaza. That discovery comes during a seven-month wave of Palestinian attacks. As Chris Mitchell reports, it's a clear sign that Israel must always, as usual, remain on guard. It's almost surreal, a beautiful pastoral setting all around. But about 100 feet underground, Hamas planned terror with this tunnel. When everything is quiet, it's like heaven. It's the most beautiful place in the world. But when it's not, it's terrifying. About a mile behind me, beyond these orchards, is the border with the Gaza Strip. About 60,000 Israelis live, work, and send their children to school in this area. The terror tunnel was found very close to this spot. Hamas says it wants to use these terror tunnels to infiltrate into Israel, murder Israelis, or kidnap them and take them back into Gaza. Sharon Calderon lives in Kibbutz Sufa, close to where the army discovered the tunnel. For more than 10 years, Hamas launched rockets across the border. Her youngest son has PTSD from the many attacks. When I'm standing here, I'm looking for where, if there's going to be alarm, when I'm going to run. Where is the closest place that we can stand that is safe enough? Since the development of the Iron Dome anti-rocket system, Hamas terrorists have gone underground. When you have missiles, most of the time we have alarm. So you have five seconds to get ready. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's not a lot, but it's five seconds. Uh, the terror tunnels, we don't know. No one knows how many of these tunnels exist, but Israel says it's working to find them. We exposed a tunnel based on four core components. Intelligence, technology, boots on the ground, and good engineering capabilities. IDF spokesman Peter Lerner said the discovery wasn't a big surprise since Hamas has been boasting about the tunnels for some time. And we have, in the last two months, been uh, uh, investing many work hours uh, day and night in order to try and uncover and expose uh, the tunnels that are penetrating into Israel. Reserve Colonel Atai Shelah sees the tunnel threat as tactical, not strategic. They can make some damage over there, and, but the image of this, it's, the most imp it's, it's more important than the damage, and they can succeed in this. Shelah says terrorist tactics have evolved from hijacking planes in the 70s to missiles and now tunnels. Israel will find solutions, he said, but it will take time. It's like a marathon here. It's a long race between the Hamas and the IDF and the state of Israel. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Kibbutz Sufa, on the border with Gaza. Well, yet another Palestinian attack, and it seems that Palestinian and terrorism go hand in hand. And what's behind that is the incitement to terrorism, where literally children are being taught to hate Jews, uh, to hate Israelis, uh, to drive them into the sea. Uh, that's being taught on both the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And if you grow up in that environment, the Jews are your mortal enemy and you must do everything in your power to kill them, then getting a teenager to board a bus with a bomb uh, seems to be easy, and that's what's going on. Until we deal with the incitement that's happening in the Palestinian Authority, we'll never see peace. And until the Palestinians come to the conclusion that they will recognize Israel's right to exist, there'll be no peace. Well, in other news, the Obama administration is planning to buy nuclear material from Iran. Efren Graham has more on that story from the CBN Newsroom. 
Gordon, the U.S. has struck another deal with Iran over its nuclear program. The Obama administration has agreed to buy 32 tons of nuclear material called heavy water from the Islamic regime. The Wall Street Journal reports the purchase is aimed at helping Iran to quickly reduce its nuclear stockpile. But the chairman of the House Foreign Relations Committee is suspicious of the deal. He's raising concerns Iran could use the money from the U.S. to fund its nuclear program or terror groups. Missouri State University is facing a lawsuit accused of discriminating against a student. MSU expelled Andrew Cash right before he was scheduled to graduate. He had expressed concern over counseling gay couples because of his religious convictions. The student's attorney says universities are supposed to be places to exchange ideas and values. He said, quote, an educator should not permit her own ideology and agenda to ruin the educational opportunities of her students. The university also ended a working relationship with the Christian Counseling Institute, where Andrew Cash was an intern. A massive hacking could threaten the upcoming elections in the Philippines. Data from nearly all 55 million registered voters has been stolen, including names, addresses, passport details, and fingerprint information. Government agents arrested a 23-year-old suspect in Manila and are still hunting for his alleged accomplices. Election officials say the May 9th elections will go ahead as planned. An election spokesperson says the polls for the automated elections will run on a server that has not been compromised. Another quake struck off the coast of Ecuador Thursday. The 6.0 aftershock coming as survivors grow desperate for basic supplies. Water is urgently needed in remote areas devastated by the much larger, larger quake that hit last Saturday. CBN Disaster Relief is on the ground bringing water purification equipment to help meet that need. Doesn't make sense. 57 As CBN Disaster Relief teams push closer to the epicenter of the earthquake, we stopped in Babahoyo, Los Rios province. There we met Colonel Leon Mancheno and teamed up with the local fire department to bring much needed aid to an already impoverished community. I've been a firefighter here for 18 years. I've never seen anything like this before. Our team was equipped with the first of many mobile water purifiers to be deployed in the hardest hit areas of Ecuador. Every hour, the unit can turn 25 gallons of the filthiest water imaginable into clean, safe drinking water. The most important thing after something like this is sanitation and clean water, so this machine will be a huge help to us. We showed the fire crew how to set up and maintain the machine so it can keep running for years to come. The logistics involved with drinking water is the hardest part. This machine will make the process much more efficient and eliminate a lot of trash. Machines like this will keep the community hydrated as they rebuild. And in the meantime, we delivered extra food and bottled water to those with immediate needs. We have never worked with CBN before. Thank you for coming to help Ecuador. We look forward to working together in the future. A long road ahead. Gordon? Well, if you want to help with the disaster relief, all you have to do is call us, 1-800-759-0700. And CBN teams are on the ground uh, providing medical care and much needed water and then the ability to purify water. And you can be a part of it by giving to the disaster relief fund. Uh, here's an address for you if you want to send us a check. It's Disaster Relief Fund, CBN Center. Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. If you want to speed your donation, call us right now, 1-800-759-0700, or you can log on to CBN.com. Terry? Well, coming up, he's a world-class artist and a former atheist. I think he's the finest evangelist in the UK at the moment. People outside the church, I would rather take them to hear Charlie than anybody else in the UK. We'll hear from Charlie McKeesey firsthand and see some of his amazing art as well right after this. Charlie McKeesey is an artist who was once an atheist, and yet today he's described as the finest evangelist in the UK. He's also one of the most unorthodox John Jessup brings us his story from London. 
Charlie Mackesy has been described as a world-class artist, selling his artwork to the likes of Whoopi Goldberg and Sting. When did you discover <laughs> that you had artistic ability? Good question. I mean, I think I probably knew that I could draw at school, but I think you need a reason to draw. He found that reason about 25 years ago in a London park. An atheist at the time, he says he had a feeling that there must be more to this than meets the eye. Jesus quietly introduced me to a journey into finding people really beautiful, which is how my art really began, because I felt inside me he was going, look, how beautiful is that guy sitting on that bench? And I would never have noticed him before. In this bronze sculpture called The Return of the Prodigal Son, Mackesy captures the raw emotion of that familiar parable. It's located here at Holy Trinity Brompton, one of the most influential churches in the Church of England. Didn't believe any of it at all. Mackesy is a popular speaker here, particularly with unbelievers. Charlie appeals to people outside of the church because he, he's not what they expect. Um, and, you know, when you have a sort of picture of the evangelist, you don't picture Charlie Mackesy. So I decided that what I'd do is, I was in bare feet anyway, so I stood on the loose seat like this. He can be a bit my head unorthodox, my head. like the day he describes hearing a gospel song for the first time at a music festival inside a portable toilet that was so filthy he stood on the seat to avoid the overflow. The song pierced through his atheism, moving him to tears. And he's very humble, very unpretentious. Uh, he tells stories against himself. I didn't really know what had happened to me. But as I was feeling it, my left foot slipped. <laughs> and I went up to here. While Mackesy's stories may not be for the faint of heart, he points out that those closest to Jesus, the disciples, could also be described as objectionable. I realized that they were naughty people, unreligious people people who didn't really have a religious etiquette, who probably wouldn't be that welcome in church. I thought Christianity was be clean, come to church, be nice, don't use the F word, and you'll be accepted and liked because that's the thing, it's a meritocracy. And if you want to belong, be a certain way. And he says you're loved. You're loved as you are, covered in whatever it is, on the inside or out. I think he's the... the finest evangelist in the UK at the moment. People outside the church, I would rather take them to hear Charlie than anybody else in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> and he wasn't joking. <laughs> That's completely ridiculous. This all comes as a shock to Mackesy, which is understandable given his life story. We, we, had, we had kind of religious things at school and I, I hated it. We sang about God, but I didn't like God. I didn't think he existed, but if he did, I didn't like him. How would you have de described or defined a Christian? Oh, someone who pretends to be good and judges people and believes in an invisible friend that they've created. After that strange yet profound encounter with Oh Happy Day, Mackesy moved to New Orleans, immersing himself in black gospel music and jazz. And I wanted to say to my friends, there's a spirit behind this that is incredible. It's so full of life. Look at it. Look at these people. Look what they believe. Look what it does to them. Mackesy sees his art foremost as a way to introduce God to the people he loves. Like prodigal daughter for a friend who struggled with bipolar disorder. You know, if you try to explain in words like, oh, God loves you or you're loved, they don't really carry any meaning at all. To be held is somewhere she, she always wanted. So I said, this is what God is like. Mackesy's art is also a record of God's presence in his own life. I really wanted to play the piano, but I was really rubbish. And for me, the angel represents the voice of God saying, I'm with you. I love you. We'll go there together. I'll help you with this. You're not alone. And this painting, simply titled, Known. But there was one day when I was on my bike crossing a bridge in London and it lasted about 11 seconds. 
but it was this kind of you're known, you're loved, this, is, this God exists and he loves you, he knows you, you're known, you're fully known, you're fully known. What darkness. You don't have to pretend to be anything. John Jessup, CBN News, London. Wonderful message. You don't have to pretend to be anything. You can just be yourself and be loved. What a wonderful testimony. What a wonderful story. And Andre Crouch wrote that song, Oh Happy Day. He wrote it uh, decades ago. Uh, and here it continues on. Terry? Remarkable story. Remarkably gifted man. Wow. Well, up next, a young man who was declared cancer-free sees the disease return with a vengeance. It was in my head, it was in my neck, it was in my stomach, my back, my lungs, everywhere and growing. Watch him beat the odds with the recovery doctors can only describe as miraculous. Jordan Lawhead was just a teenager when he first beat melanoma. He was 23 when the cancer returned full throttle. At first, he was given six months to live. But soon after that, doctors declared that he would die within a few days. You hear the knock at the door. You hear the, the doctor kind of coming in, sitting down. And you can tell just by the look on his face that this isn't going to be good. It had been six years since Jordan Lawhead had surgery to remove the malignant melanoma on his neck. Now 23, he learned the cancer had returned. This time it was stage four and had spread to his brain and beyond. It was in my head, it was in my neck, it was in my stomach, my back, my lungs, everywhere and growing. Even with treatment, doctors at Vanderbilt University Medical Center gave Jordan only six months to live. What you feel in that time is your heart is racing and your, your mind is racing. You feel broken, completely broken and devastated and just reaching for whoever you can and whoever you can, you're reaching for is broken too. Why him, Lord? Why, why, not, why not me? I would rather take, take his place and and deal with all the suffering and the pain and agony and, and all of that rather than have him go through it. Doctors immediately started radiation to shrink the tumor in Jordan's brain. They also performed two emergency surgeries to remove part of his bowel and his appendix. Then Jordan's life expectancy dropped to just a few days when doctors discovered a fast growing tumor on his neck. He was uh, threatening to pressure on his windpipe, you know, on trachea, which of course he would not be able to breathe and he would die immediately. Doctors felt Jordan's only hope was interleukin-2. The FDA considers it a black box drug, one that when used could be fatal. So we really were pushed into doing the risky treatment under even riskier circumstances. We had probably two days left to do it or not to do it at all. And it was in that moment, I had to decide to believe that God has made us as individuals and not statistics. Jordan and his parents had been fervently praying for his recovery and as word spread, Jordan heard from people all over the world. I had so many people praying for me. I was very fortunate to, to, uh, to hear from them. I had old people praying for me. I had kids praying for me. I had just strangers writing me, telling me, texting me that they were praying, asking God to intervene. I prayed for hours and I prayed the Lord would have mercy in everything that we had. Every ounce of our faith was relying that this boy would be rescued. The tumors began to shrink after the first treatment, taking Jordan out of immediate danger. It was slightly surprising to me. It was surprising to my family and it was surprising to the doctors. And when everybody's surprised and uh, feeling positive and excited slightly, 
holding their breath. We just were all like, let's keep going. Let's keep fighting. Give me another dose of that horrible stuff because it's working. And I've, I'm going to go for it even if it kills me. Over the next several months, Jordan endured three more rounds of interleukin. Then 18 months after Jordan was diagnosed, he was once again waiting for the doctor's knock on the door. And they said these very interesting words. Jordan has had a confirmed, complete response. The heartbreak that we talked about, the pain, the physical pain, was redeemed. It was a confirmed, complete response to the drug, <laughs> to the power of God intervening by all the people praying. It's been eight years since Jordan was given six months to live. With only 2% recovery rate for these cases, Dr. Puzinov says Jordan beat the odds. He is now 31 year old man with no cancer visible in brain or in body. Today, Jordan is a songwriter and musician and runs youinspire.org, a website to encourage others who face similar trials. But most of all, he is grateful to a God of mercy who can be trusted. I believe it taught me to see him as he is and as I am, and that I need to be joyfully dependent on his mercy at all times, that I'm not in control, that he is, and that when I put my trust in him, with every part of my life, whether it's my health, my joy and career and plans and money and all of that, that I can be joyfully dependent on him because he is merciful and I have the scars to prove it. You're almost home. Jordan's story clearly outlines that it's not an easy thing to be uh, recognized that you are totally dependent on him. But that scenario brought him to a place where he could do that joyfully, trusting the mercy and the grace and the love of God for all things. We want to pray for you now. We know there are some of you who are facing some pretty difficult circumstances. So be encouraged by some of these other reports. You have one, Gordon. I've got one from Bob. Recently, Terry gave a word of knowledge about someone who had vertigo due to an inner ear problem. About three years ago, I suddenly developed Meniere's disease. Mm. Symptoms are hearing loss and vertigo, and there is no known cure. I've had several flare-ups this year and have taken about a week off from work because of this. Since claiming Terry's word of knowledge, the condition has resolved. Thanks be to Praise God. God. Yeah. Well, here's one from Gloria. On April 4th this year, she was watching this program in her office in Nigeria. And Gordon, <laughs> you gave a word of knowledge. You mentioned her name, the exact ailment. She says, I've had a serious back pain for over 15 years. On this day, when Gordon mentioned my name, I claimed my healing and praised God. The pain has disappeared, never to return. I thank you, Jesus, and I thank the 700 Club. <laughs> and let's thank God for that. He dwells, he inhabits the praises of his people. Just rejoice before him and say, this is the day the Lord has made. If you're in, in, in sick, if you're in pain, don't rejoice over the sickness or over the pain. God's not asking you to do that. Rejoice over what he's about to do. Rejoice that he stands by his word to perform it. Rejoice that he's given you life and breath He's given you unbelievable gifts from heaven. Rejoice over that and just watch him work and, and watch that he wants to know you intimately. And he's not, he hasn't created things so he'll abandon you. That's not God. God wants to be with you and be your all in all. So we're going to claim a wonderful verse. When two or more agree touching anything, it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. These are the words of Jesus, and you can trust them. Now, why does God do this? So that the Son would be glorified. Isn't that wonderful? It's not based on anything that we do. 
It's not based on how much you pray or how much you fast or how much resolutions you make or what your bargain is with God. No, it's so that Jesus would be glorified. So let's just rejoice in that. That's good news. Let's rejoice in that. Let's pray. Let's believe. And let's let God do what God has promised to do. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Lord, we just come together in agreement right now. And we agree touching these illnesses, this, this pain, these sicknesses now. And as people just reach out and lay hands on that area of the body that needs healing, we join with them. And together we say out loud to it, be healed now and be every bit whole in the name of Jesus. Receive your miracle now, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Uh, there's someone named Andy. You have a um, uh, tumor in the upper right-hand portion of your brain, and it's swelling, and you've got severe pain. Right now, God is touching that, and you just felt something like uh, oil, um, uh, just tingling oil, just flow over the top of your head all the way into your body. That tumor is shrinking now in the name of Jesus. That pain is leaving you. And just rejoice. Just lift your hands and rejoice over what God has just done for you. Terry? There's someone else. Your name is not Andy, but Angie. And But it's not just you. There are many of you who are under like this just cloud of darkness. It's so dark for you that you can't even come to the place of, of faith and trusting again. Right now, in Jesus' name, be set free from that as light pours into your spirit. Just receive the joy of the Lord as he restores unto you the joy of your salvation. Lift your hands up and begin to praise him. It's gone in Jesus' name. Uh, there's someone else you've got a uh, problem with your right ear. I don't know if it's a growth or an infection, but it's just all swollen and it seems to just be wrapped around your ear. God's just releasing that and, and just healing that right now. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name, what you couldn't do before, do it now. You couldn't open that right jaw without pain. Mm -hmm. Just open it now and realize it's all been taken care of. Your ear is now open. You can now hear out of it in Jesus' name. Be restored, be made whole. Someone else, you've got deteriorating verte vertebra in your spine, um, and you're just uh, losing calcium and, and uh, losing the, the cushioning between the vertebra, uh, and you're just in constant pain. God's able to restore. Yeah. He's able to restore. So he's restoring bone to you right now. He's restoring cartilage to you. He's restoring all all of the, the things that you need to be pain-free in Jesus' name. Now, do what you couldn't do before. If you couldn't rotate that spine with, with, without pain, do it now and just see what God has done for you. He's releasing it now. Someone else with a right shoulder, deep pain in the socket, inability to move your right arm, uh, just take it out and start moving it and realize you've been released. That pain is gone now. In Jesus' name. You, and there's someone else. You have some kind of a spinal growth. That's, I, I, the picture I see is just like a snake wrapped around your spine, but it's really impacted your mobility. That thing is withering up and dying right now. And do what Gordon said. Do the thing you couldn't do before. You'll be amazed in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for all that you've done, all you are doing, all you are. And we receive it now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Few have been healed. We want to share your good report. We want to share your story. So give us a call, 1-800-759-0700. And if you need prayer, we're here for you. We believe in prevailing prayer, the prayer that gets an answer, the prayer that doesn't give up. And so if you need someone to pray with you, all you have to do is call us. We want to pray. 1-800-759-0700. Derek? Well, still ahead, he was a rising rock star, totally hooked on fame. There's 15,000 people out there, and then they turn the lights off, and you hear the roar, and you walk out on that stage. I was being worshipped, and I love that. 
See what led this singer to the brink of suicide. That's later on today's 700 Club. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump has come out against North Carolina's bathroom law. The law says biological sex determines who goes into male and female restrooms in government buildings. But Trump argues North Carolina is paying a big price for passing the law. And he says people should be able to use whichever bathroom they choose. His main rival, Senator Ted Cruz, says it's about safety for women and girls. He thought that men should be able to go into the girls' bathroom if they want to. Now, let me ask you, have we gone stark raving nuts? Cruz says Trump is just giving in to political correctness. Operation Blessing is in Japan helping with earthquake recovery. Last week's quake split the ground, destroyed homes, and displaced tens of thousands of people. Operation Blessing is working with local churches and volunteers from all over the country to deliver supplies. They're also using social media to reach victims. One tweet was received from a resident on the northernmost island needing supplies for young children. Operation Blessing was able to deliver diapers and hygiene items and connected them with a local church. You can find out more about Operation Blessing by going to their website at ob.org. Gordon and Terry will be right back with more of the 700 Club right after this. In a remote village in China, an elderly widow and a lonely boy have formed a strong family bond, even though they're not really related at all. But not long ago, their friendship was in jeopardy because of a lack of clean water. When Mama Jike's husband died, she felt like giving up. But instead, she reached out to others, like young Amu. Much of the time, his parents work out of town. I was alone a lot, but Mama took care of me like I was her own son. She cooked and cleaned and helped with my homework. Mama has such a good heart. Having Amu has given me meaning and purpose in my older years. Every day, Mama Jike walked almost three miles on a dangerous mountain road to a ditch, where she fetched two little buckets of water to live on. It wasn't even clean, actually. It had animal feces in it, but it was the only and best water source we had. One day, Mama Jake tried to fetch more water than normal. The ground was slick from summer rains, and she slipped. I could barely breathe, and I thought I was going to die. Amu found her on the ground. I tried to get her to stand up, but she could not move, so I ran back to the village for help. I started crying and a horrible thought crossed my mind. I might lose her forever. Mama Jike sprained her back and was in bed for two months. During that time, Amu took care of her and fetched water. Sometimes I was so tired, I wanted to quit. But then I would remember how much Mama had helped me and I would find strength. It was my chance to repay her love with my love and be selfless like she was. But the water he brought back was still filthy. When CBN heard about the situation, we quickly set up a clean water system for Mama Jike's village. We built a cistern and laid pipes straight to everyone's homes. So today, there's fresh water right at Mama Jike's fingertips. All we have to do is to turn the tap, and we can drink the water right away. It's so clean, and there's so much of it. Now Mama won't ever fall down getting water again. We can spend more time together. And it is CBN who made this all happen. You cared for me and gave me hope. I never thought there were people as kind as you. Thank you for your selfless love. Thank you, CBN Partners. You are making miracles happen in the lives of people all around the world. This is a miracle for this woman, for this young boy, for their entire village. I love when she says, all you have to do is turn the tap with that wonder in her voice. And there's so much of it. 
and it's clean and drinkable and usable. We say thank you. Drilling wells, providing clean drinking water, that's just one of the things CBN does around the world for people in need. And it all happens because people like you care enough to make a difference in the lives of people who don't have what they need to live every day. It's 65 cents a day, just $20 a month to join the 700 Club. If you haven't joined yet, today is a great day to do it. You and I have a chance to make an incredible difference in the lives of others. In a world that's kind of crazy all around us today, isn't it good to know that all you have to do is go to the phone right now and say, I want to join the 700 Club, and immediately you'll be a part of having that kind of impact in people's lives. When you go to the phone and call, will you do something else? Will you join using Pledge Express? That's electronic monthly giving. It means your bank does all the work. It's pretty wonderful, actually. You don't have to have stamps or envelopes on hand. You don't have to remember to send anything. Bank does all the work for you, and you can stop at any time you want. But for us, it saves some administrative costs, so we can put even more of your gift into the lives of people like Mama Jikes. So call now. Our number's toll-free, 1-800-759-0700. Just say, I want to join the 700 Club, and I'd like to do it using Pledge Express. When you use Pledge Express, we're going to send you Power for Life teachings. These are teachings we get here at CBN as a CBN family. We want to share them with you. You'll get one every month. So call now. We thank you in advance. Gordon? Well, up next, he was a singer in a rock and roll band until crack cocaine consumed his life. All I was living for was just that chunk of money to put in that dealer's hand to stay in this state. It was absolute just hell on earth. Hear how a voice speaks life to this young man just as he's about to slit his wrist. David Frazier thrived on singing with his band Outspoken. He craved the attention of his fans like a drug. And then one night, David tried crack cocaine. And suddenly, performing on stage paled in comparison. There's 15,000 people out there. And then they turn the lights off. And you hear the roar. And you walk out on that stage. That right there was just the be all and end all. It was everything. With a hit single and lucrative record deal, David Frazier and his band Outspoken were on the verge of rock stardom. But crack cocaine would cost David everything and bring him to the point of suicide. A pastor's kid, David had a relatively uneventful childhood. Then at six years old, he was sexually molested by an older boy. Everything just shifted inside, and it was a type of guilt that um, I, I, you can't even put into words. At the same time, it awakened feelings he couldn't understand. It was like coming to the edge of an ocean, and it was all yours. Pleasure, opportunities, outlets. Later, he discovered pornography. As an addiction slowly took hold, he became bitter towards his family and God. I didn't know, where is this? Why has this happened? Why do I feel this way? Why do I feel so angry? Why do I feel so afraid? And, and why does it feel like I'm um, just being crushed under the weight of, of guilt? In high school, he used pot to mask his sense of shame. He also threw himself into activities, especially music, to make sure no one knew his secret or his pain. If I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna be the best at it. And that way people think that I got it all together on the outside and, and you know, they won't see the, the real. After high school and a short stint in the Marines, David helped form the band Outspoken. Before long, the group was playing in front of thousands of admiring fans, and David thrived on it. That was the new drug. I, I was being worshiped. I knew that when they saw me, they would be chasing me through the hallways, and I loved that. Being a rock star fueled David's need for sex and drugs. But out of the spotlight, he felt the sting of being alone. When I would come off the road, nobody there, no praise. I would fall into this deep despair. And so I'd sit there in the middle of, the, of my apartment, just in pure depression. And hey, I got a good idea. Let's go get some drugs. That'll make me feel good. 
Eventually, David tried crack cocaine. It gave him a high he had never experienced, and soon, getting his fix was the only thing that mattered. All I was living for was just that chunk of money to put in that dealer's hand to stay in this state. He started missing rehearsals and recording sessions. Eventually, he was kicked out of the band. For the next five years, he was in and out of crack houses. It was absolute just hell on earth. And, and I wanted to stay there because to come back to reality was just too painful. Several times he tried to get clean and even tried going to church, but he couldn't escape his addictions or the man he had become. Just an empty shell of a person. No hope, no purpose, no meaning. What am I here for? What am I doing? One day, while trying to score some drugs, David was mugged. Left me there on the street. They slashed my tires. So I'm stuck with no money. And I was so out of my mind, I couldn't even function. David lost all hope. Scraping up some loose change, he bought a bottle of beer. After he drank it, he broke the bottle, intending to use the jagged edges to end his life. While my hand was an inch over my wrist, I, he I heard the, the Lord speak to me. He said, get out of your car and call your mom right now. And it was just like something came over me where I just didn't have a choice, like I was being moved. David says at last he felt peace. There was hope for the first time in my life, and I knew what the hope was. It's Jesus. Shortly after, his brother picked him up, and the next day, the family got him to a rehab facility. He says his desire for drugs went away immediately, but he still had to face the truth. Eventually, I just, I just broke, because it was difficult to face the problem. It was, was not the drugs, which was not the pornography. It was not even the music. It was, it was me. I, I was the problem. David gave his life and devotion to God. I understood that Jesus was God and that he died for me. And I understood that he wasn't just enough. He was more than enough. In all of that madness, he pursued me. He didn't let me go. And I said, I can worship a God like that. And I understood that the God I thought he was was not the God he really is. David admits it was hard, but with God's help and forgiveness, he overcame his addiction to pornography and his guilt. He married Kim in 2009, and today he leads an online Bible institute and counsels men struggling with sexual addiction. He was still there. He was always there. That's, that's what blows me away the most. And he pursued me the whole way through. And he's pursuing you. If you're watching this right now, maybe you're living David's story. Uh, or maybe you're living a different one, but you've created something. You've created someone that you look at in the mirror and you go, who are you? And you're asking the same questions David asked. What's my purpose? What, what am I doing? Why can't I stop doing these things? Why, why can't I just leave it? Why can't I, why can't I become what I want to be? David's wonderful revelation, he was the problem. You know, pornography wasn't the problem. Crack cocaine wasn't the problem. He was the problem. Those were just symptoms of a deep underlying problem that he didn't like himself. He didn't like what he'd become. He didn't like what had happened to him when he was a young boy. He didn't like any of that. And what he finally found was a savior who was able to change all that and change David from his innermost being and make him new again. Just as if he had never done any of those things or any of those things had ever happened to him. God is literally able to recreate you breathe on you again and give you a new soul, a new spirit, a new heart, a new life. How do you get it? Same way David did, you reach the end of yourself 
And then when God speaks, you say, yes, Lord, here I am. Now, how do you get that? How do you, how do you get to that point? You ask for it. It's that simple. You just ask for it. It's a very simple prayer. If you want this, if you want a new life, a new beginning, bow your head with me. Let's pray a very simple prayer, and let's let Jesus do all the rest. Pray with me. Jesus, that's right, just say his name, say it out loud. I want to change, and I hear that you can do that. I hear that you can recreate me, that you can forgive me, that you can make me new. So Jesus, forgive me. Cleanse me. Come into my heart. And if you do this for me, I want to follow you all the days of my life. Hear my prayer, for I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, for those who just prayed, I ask for a baptism in your love. I ask that you would just surround them with your presence and your power and let them know that they have been delivered and set free today. Do it, Lord, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed with me, there's one thing I want you to do. I want you to go to the phone and give us a call and let us know. 1-800-759-0700 and just say, I prayed with that guy on TV. When you call, I've got a free packet for you. It's called A New Day, and there's a CD teaching. What do Christians do now? What do, how do you live the Christian life? It's all free. Phone calls free. Call now. 1-800-759-0700. We'll be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. I want to bring it on with one of the questions that came in from John. He asks, you often hear that fear is the tool of the devil. However, the Bible tells us we should fear God. When we worship God, are we doing it out of fear of his wrath? And is that the same as loving God? Uh, John, there's a problem with translation uh, of the Hebrew word, uh, you know, fear of the Lord. It, it means awe. Have awe and reverence for him. Uh, understand that he is the ruler of the universe. Uh, that in his hands is complete and total power. So when you realize that, uh, there's an awesomeness to that, and it sort of brings you up short, if, if, is the English phrase, where you say, okay, I, I, I better stand at attention here. Uh, you know, you, you're not casual with this. Um, you don't um, take it casually. You take it very, very seriously. And that's what that word means. And so when you see that, the fear of the Lord, uh, in your own mind, just translate it, the awe of the Lord uh, and how awesome he is. Uh, it's not the fear, irrational fear that the devil puts on us. It's the awesomeness of God and the, our respect that just comes naturally when you have that. We leave you these words from Acts 13. I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. God bless you. We'll see you again.